Hey guys, welcome to your channel, Digital Empaths, where we discuss on the interesting trends and the different aspects of the digital ecosystem. I'm your host, Sushant Tajmani, and today we have with us Marty Armstrong, who is a digital industry veteran and has spent over two decades in the industry, spanning various roles and responsibilities in marketing, product, corporate, and business development. So Marty, welcome, and it's such a privilege to have you with us today. Thank you for having me, Sushant. Happy to be here. Great. So, Marty, uh, before we start a Q&A round, I'm just curious to know, how are you coping up in this lockdown phase? I know there's a lot of unrest in the United States. A lot of protests are going on. And the economy is also not in a very good shape. The unemployment claims are rising week over week. So, what, what's your take on that? Uh, you know, it is, it's a, it's a very interesting time here in the States, um, as it is, I think, you know, across the world, but I think, uh, you know, we've got, as you, as you mentioned, there's a, a bit of a confluence of events happening here, right? From starting with the pandemic and then, uh, the recent George Floyd, uh, uh issues that, that has caused, you know, the, the kind of uprising and, and, uh, and in most cases, I think probably peaceful protests, although I think, uh, you know, it's a, it's easier to focus on you know some of the some of the unfortunate scenarios, right, that are happening. Uh, but I think there's there's a lot of stuff as as you point out going on here. Unemployment is absolutely a factor, right, resulting from COVID nineteen uh, in large part. Uh, I think we're starting to see uh, you know a little bit of a turnaround in the short term, um, which I think a lot of folks expected as we get into the summer months. Um, I think uh, we expect to see, you know, kind of unemployment slow up a little bit, right? Some of the folks get back into the workforce. Um, maybe not 100% of the folks that were put on furloughs, right, uh, or leaves, but, uh, you know, hopefully a decent percentage of them uh, back into the workforce, which I think we just had actually had a surprising good number uh, for, for the month of May. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, that may be exactly what that is. It's folks being kind of recalled, so to speak, back into the workforce. So I think in the short term, um, I think there'll, you know, there'll be some bumps and ups and downs. Unfortunately, this is all also happening in an election year here in the U.S. Yeah. And so I think that creates another dynamic, right, where, um, you know, there, there's no, there's very little shades of gray, right? There, you're either, you're on one side or you're on the other side. And that's an unfortunate, um, that's an unfortunate dynamic that's, uh, that's happening right now. But uh, I think the next few months will probably get a little bit back to kind of productivity, a little bit back to living, I wouldn't say back to normal, but back kind of out and about a little bit, so to speak, right? Um, I think uh, there's an inertia behind that. But I think the big question is going to be, you know, if and when this kind of second wave, so to speak, hits in the fall, uh, what will be the reality then? Will this go immediately back to what it was, call it back in March, right, when everything started to just shut down? Um, or will, they, will there be a, a more tempered response um, and therefore hopefully maybe less of an impact on the economy as well? Uh, I think that's TBD. I think there's reason to believe that they won't have to have such an extreme reaction in the second wave, that they'll have time to be prepared, build up supplies, build up processes, testing, et cetera. Um, but I think that's, uh, that's to, be de uh, to be determined. Yeah, I hope everything uh, recovers faster because we, the similar trend we have seen in the Asia also, I think the biggest challenge that we are experiencing here in, in Asia is the labor migration, because since the pandemic has started in the last two, three months, approximately 10 to 15 million people, especially who are working in the, the MSMEs with the sector, which has been impacted the most, I think a lot of factories have been shut and this entire labor force has now gone back to their hometowns. And the biggest challenge now for the, the state and the central government is how to bring them back and how to keep them in the quarantine phase for a certain weeks before they reignite the whole MSME sector. So that's, that's another type of challenge that we are facing here in the Asian yeah. country. I think the good thing that I, we are seeing here, especially that the China is also, also, I think, recovered a lot. I think they are going through their new normal phase right now. And especially for the Western countries whose supply chain is exposed to China and a, lot, a big chunk of the procurement 
a big chunk of uh, uh, the component development which happens in China, I think that has reignited already. So we are hoping in the next few months, things might, I think, turn around in a better way. But still, I think once the demand will shoot up, supply would not be enough to meet that demand. I think that's the biggest fear right now everyone has. I think, I think that's, a fair, that's a fair thought there because I think, uh, again, there will be this immediate kind of kickback, right? I think there's this pent up demand um, for uh, uh, across the board. Uh, and I think that, you know, there's what that new normal is and geographically what a new normal will be will vary, right? Um, and economically it will vary. But I think there's, there's, a, there's a relative sense of pent up demand um, and business and consumer. Uh, and I think that um, how each company, how each individual, how each geography is set up to react to that and prepare for that um, is, uh, is a big question mark, right? Because I think the reality is most folks, well, really almost everybody really hasn't gone through a scenario like that, right? Th uh, like this, right? There, there isn't, hasn't been a major pandemic like this in generations. So there's, there's no playbook, so to speak, that folks are, that are working from. There's a lot of smart people trying to, to, trying to predict a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of different scenarios and plan accordingly. Um, and even with governments, right? You see governments doing the same. Um, but I think the reality is uh, we don't know what we don't know yet. So, you know, make your best guess, plan accordingly, be conservative, um, and, uh, and then, you know, um, and hope for the best. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, Maitri, I know you have spent a big chunk of your career in the e-commerce sector and uh, worked with some of the uh, big marketplaces in the past. So now, if I look at the last few weeks, I know the e-commerce penetration has shoot up. And surprisingly, we are seeing numbers like 27, 28%, which were like, wow. And uh, if you look at the last, prior to that, we were fluctuating around 16, 17%. So well, what's, what's your take on that? So I, I think uh, in a lot of respects, um, the pandemic, right, uh, has been an accelerant to trends that were already, I think, taking form, taking place. And so folks that were, uh, you know, businesses that had a really good idea of who their customer was, um, had already started to make strong investments in supply chain and customer experience. Um, and building up kind of a relationship with their customers and understanding what they need and when they need it and where they need it. Uh, I think those folks, uh, those businesses were, were already kind of on a path to take advantage of a situation like this that they otherwise wouldn't have seen coming, right? So if you had, um, if you were a brand that uh, had already started to make the pivot not a complete pivot, but you started to diversify into a DTC mode, right? A direct to consumer mode where you weren't hundred percent reliant on your traditional channels and retail. As an example, um, you were much better positioned when this pandemic hit than if you were in kind of the old school retail, 100% reliant on or 90 plus percent reliant on your channels. Right, um, because now you're beholden to how are they now positioned to deal with the pandemic, right? And are they in situations that are even out of their control, right? You know, when uh, at least here in the states, right, many, uh, many, uh, uh, many of the states within the country had just flat out shut down the ability to go physically shop in stores, right? And so, if you were not a, a business that had omnichannel, as an example, right, the ability to um, you know, facilitate, you know, this, the, the big, the big uh, uh, kind of buzz catchphrase that a lot of these folks were applying to their business was contactless, right? So, um, but in order to execute contactless in, in, a, in a pretty seamless way, you already, if you didn't already have a good way in which to identify orders, match it against your inventory, match it against customer expectations, and then deliver it in a way that is both still cost effective, but also, uh, you know, going to meet the customer demands. Um, if you didn't already have that set up in place, you really weren't well positioned to offer, you know, what the kind of new contactless uh, customer experience um, expectation had become, 
right? And so like, that's one example of, so I think that there's a number of these companies that had already made these investments over the last number of years, um, you know, brands starting to build a direct to consumer channel, uh, brands and retailers building out an omni-channel um, experience, investing in, in the post-order experience, right? The logistics, the time to delivery, the options, the notifications, the ability to schedule and determine, do I want to go pick it up somewhere? Am I happy having it here? Whatever the case may be. So I think those that were making those investments were, were well positioned. Those that, that weren't or were just you know, dipping their toe in the water, unfortunately, um, were the ones who, uh, who kind of got caught a little bit uh, behind this wave that, that you otherwise didn't see coming. Um, and then, you know, the big got bigger, right? So Amazon, Walmart, uh, the folks that already had, had built out these infrastructures, they had scale um, and could... Uh, could easily execute against that or more easily execute against that. I wouldn't say they, you know, they each had their bumps um, in dealing with that, but um, the big get bigger in some cases like this, unfortunately too. Yeah. And I think the very similar trend we are seeing in the Asian countries too. I think the interesting thing here is that if you look at all the large CPG, FMCG players, they all have been relying on their channel partners for a long, long time and by selling in bulk, uh, meeting those big POs, and uh, and they always have this stable supply chain, very linear supply chain ecosystem in place. And uh, suddenly now they are seeing the emergence in the e-commerce wave. The biggest challenge for them also is that how to bifurcate, basically, how to take the e-commerce supply chain different from the the traditional retail, uh, the channel partner supply chain, because the traditional channels did not have too much demand volatility. They knew right. that how many pieces they need, how many packs they need, how many pallets they would need on a weekly basis and a monthly basis. But now suddenly, the moment the D2C things picked it up, the e-commerce piece picked it up, the whole demand volatility has come up now. And they're struggling now how to meet that demand volatility, how to meet those kind of inventory fill rates for this particular channel. So, yeah. so are you seeing that uh, as we progress in this sector, more and more companies will embrace the idea of maintaining parallel supply chains for different channels? I, I think they're gonna have to, yeah, because I think that it's, and it's twofold to what you just said there, right? One is, is getting that type of inf infrastructure, right? Either directly yourself or through relationships that you set up, uh, getting that type of capacity and infrastructure in place, the ability to scale it up or down as you need, but the other piece of that is the intelligence, right? Understanding, which goes back to my, my earlier point of understanding who the customer is, right? Where they are, what their kind of purchase uh, behavior is, their patterns are, and then how that impacts, how that influences how you manage the supply against that demand, right? So understanding, it's one thing to have the capability um, from a logistics perspective and a supply chain perspective, but how you throttle that and how you manage that um, to meet both customer expectations, but also manage against your, your profitability, your, your cost you know, measurements, your cost effectiveness. I think that's the key. And I think folks are, are going to have to make those investments on both ends of that. Um, and, uh, and I think, and unfortunately, there'll be some who make the investments on the supply chain, the infrastructure, but maybe learn the hard way. They don't understand enough yet about their, who their customers are and how they buy. Because to your point, they had, it was, you know, if it isn't broke, don't fix it, right? They were so used to kind of a similar pattern, pattern of seasonal change, right? Of order, order volumes and order types um, coming through their channel partners that, uh, that it was a, you know, it's, it's very different when you're dealing with your customers directly. And uh, whether that's 5% of your business or it's 50% of your business, um, it's, a, it's a combination of capability and intelligence. So I think that those two, and, and to your earlier point, like, do I think e-commerce will stay at 25, 30% of, of, uh, of retail from here on out? Um, I don't think I addressed that. So I think generally speaking, you know, who really knows, but uh, I think that to my earlier point, it's an accelerant, right? So I think retail uh, e-commerce has steadily and will continue to become a higher percentage of retail, right? Uh, for a lot of the reasons we just talked about, 
It's, it's what the customers are demanding and it's what the brands and, and the merchants should be executing against to give them self diversity and control of their business. Um, but, you know, will it stay at that level in the short term? Uh, whenever we get back to what this new normal is, right? And I think, again, to our earlier conversation, new normal could be fall this year, it could be spring next year, it could be winter of next year. Uh, I think, and, and that will vary by different areas of the world, most likely. Um, but when you get to whatever that new normal is, um, it'll probably come back down a little bit, right? Um, let's say, you know, the, the real milestone, so to speak, that you want to see e-commerce try to hold to consistently would be probably around that 20% mark at some point. Um, will it do that immediately? Will it hold that threshold? Eh, I don't know about that. I think a lot of it kind of depends on how quick this new normal happens, right? I think um, if we do have this big, at least here in the United States, this big second wave, uh, that, that will most likely artificially keep that percentage of retail higher. Um, I don't think it's going to completely go back down to the levels it was pre-COVID though. My guess is it will, it'll base off into a slightly higher level and then, and then hopefully, hopefully uh, you'll start to see it closer to uh, 20% over the next couple of years will be kind of its new normal percentage, right? On a, on a kind of aggregate basis. Um, but who knows, maybe, maybe it will, maybe it will be higher, but I think, I think it's natural to see that there was a big swing for obvious reasons. It'll come back a little bit, but I don't expect it to go all the way back down. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And the other thing is, Marty, we have seen here in, in India too, the Amazons and other players who are delivering the stuff. I think the, the major category which has got the jump is the daily essentials, the groceries and the, all the basic consumer products. Because rest of the categories, they're not serving right now because of the lockdown phase. Because right. even the government has also put a very strict controls around that. How to keep the limited number of fleet on the road, limited number of transportation vehicles on the road. So I think even though they are running at 30-40% of their capacity in terms of sales and distribution, the major category which has really caused the jump is the daily essentials. So Exactly. Yeah, and I think if that trend continues, I think that's going to be a really big advantage for all the CPG and FMCG players. Yeah. It absolutely will. I yeah. think when you start getting back into more uh, whatever kind of the new normal of discretionary spending, right, um, that starting to balance out that mix a little bit will be, I think, the determining factor as well as just this innate you know, uh, in, in inherent need for folks to just kind of get out. We're, we're social <laughs> by nature, right? So I think yeah. there is an element to get out to stores, to make purchases. Now, again, how many of them will be, you know, purchases that in part are picking up online orders? You know, yeah. that, that may start to shift up a, a bit as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think that you're right. A lot, of, a lot of the shift in terms of percentage of e-commerce, um, in, in the last couple of months uh, for certain was, was in relation to the essentials, right? And, um, and I think that's a big reason why I do see it coming back down um, because I think other, other categories, other merchandise types will start to bubble back up as folks feel a little bit more comfortable, folks feel they can go and spend on maybe stuff that are non-essential again uh, in, in, a, in a more traditional way. And then that will, that will start to bring the, the percentage mix between traditional retail and e-commerce, I think uh, back to whatever its new normal will be. Um, but a big dynamic in that, of course, is also going to be you know unemployment, right? I think uh, as as the workforce gets back, right, or when it gets back to a to a, it, it probably won't get. It probably take some time to get back to what it was pre-COVID. Uh, but if it can get back to a more reasonable level um, from say you know three, four, five years ago. Um, then maybe uh, you'll start to see that mix again of uh, you know discretionary spending versus staples and essentials and etc. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and Marty, I know you have been uh, for the last few years. You have been playing various advisory roles. You have been working closely with the VCs and the, the early stage startups. So can you tell a little bit about uh, your new venture that you have been running for the past three years? That uh, what kind of sectors you are uh, focusing on and what kind of advisory services you are giving to the startups? Yeah. Sure. So uh, my, my focus, I try to stay relatively within my wheelhouse, right? Um, 
I, uh, I've been lucky enough to work largely within my network over the last few years, right? As you mentioned, I've been in the e-commerce industry for nearly two decades in one form or another. Um, and so where I really focus most on, and in some cases I've worked with some earlier stage startups as they're just thinking about, you know, their market opportunity, maybe getting some capital for the business, right? Um, figuring out what their, their go to market, their pricing, their packaging, that type of stuff might look like, might feel like, what gives them the best opportunity. So there's that element uh, of, uh, of engagement where I've, I've had, which is enjoyable. I, I like talking to companies at, at you know, those earlier stages, trying to figure out what their North Star is, so to speak, right? Um, and then uh, in other cases, uh, you know, it's more traditional uh, work that, that I have been doing uh, uh, prior to me going out on my own. So working primarily with, not with the retailers per se, although I'm in the retail e-commerce space, I work more on the vendor side, right? So with the technology companies, the service companies that are, are delivering products and services to these retailers, right? Whether it's omni-channel technology, marketing or personalization technology or whatever the case may be, things that um, are helping them execute their business more effectively at scale, uh, than they would otherwise kind of do on their own. Um, and so I think uh, for me, it's more about how are, how are we helping, how am I helping that company grow their business, open new lines of, of revenue streams, right? Thinking about more strategic kind of partnerships and strategic opportunities for them to work uh, within or create an ecosystem of their own uh, or work within established ecosystems, again, as an as a amplification of their business. Um, and so I think that some combination of helping them work with the business community to get a business going, and then also helping work within an ecosystem or create an ecosystem um, that, uh, that will help accelerate their business, right? Through partnerships and, uh, and alliances and, uh, and certain strategic ventures, right? That uh, can sometimes get a little bit overbearing or com complex uh, if it's not something you have uh, experience dealing with yourself. So I've enjoyed it and I've enjoyed the flexibility of, uh, of working, uh, working from home and, uh, it has its ups and challenges, uh, ups and downs, but I, but I've enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, so my, uh, Marty, I know being an uh, advisor, uh, if I look at the last financial year, in fact, the year prior to that also, so 2018 and 2019, I think cons is considered to be the best years for the VC sector. I think a lot mm -hmm. of investments have been done. I remember in 2018, over 140 billion were invested. And in 2019, close to $136 billion was invested, especially in North America itself, across different industries. And uh, surprisingly, we are seeing some new industries coming up, like FinTech is like growing like anything. Even in India last year, we saw over $6 billion have been invested, especially in the financial sector. So we're seeing a lot of new sectors cropping up. Logistics is becoming a big sector and a lot of unicorns have emerged in the last couple of financial years. Over 13, 14 companies have become unicorns, especially in the logistics sector itself. So based on your experience in the last few months or in the last one year, what kind of sectors that you see have shown a lot of resilience and responsiveness in this kind of a pandemic? And, uh, and what sectors you see are kind of showing a lot of vulnerability? Yeah, so I think it's interesting to say that. So I think that uh, some, of the, some of the ones you call out are actually the ones that I think are, are ripe for the investment and growth, right? So I think that uh, FinTech uh, is one area that I think over the last few years really um, has been, uh, and, it, it, and FinTech in and of itself as a label is a pretty broad label, but I think... Um, it is, it is a, it's, a, it's a hot area of investment and growth for a reason. I think you've had, for a very, very long time, you've had archaic systems uh, working with, uh, with uh, you know, very few kind of number of uh, players, right? The MasterCards, the Visas, the American Expresses. Um, there's, not, there's, not a, a, uh, there's not as broad and deep in, uh, of a... Um, of an ecosystem in that regard, right? At the, for the folks that you kind of like your barrier of entry, it was, it was a very kind of select view. If you were a merchant uh, that wanted to transact, right? Or enable your customers to purchase things from you, um, however and whenever, 
your options were, were fairly focused and limited, right? And so you had a few folks that kind of represented the innovative next field, right? Like PayPal, even though PayPal has been around for, you know, 20 years, right? Uh, or somewhere about that. Um, so I do think, you know, you get folks that are kind of rewriting what that industry is and will look like. Uh, I think, you know, it's not just the introductions of things like crypto, right? Which are also kind of flipping that industry on its head a little bit and, and getting people to think about what the future might be. I think we still have, in my opinion, no idea where that's really going to lead us. Um, I think it will make some type of transformational change to the industry. But, you know, do I think every company in the world is going to have its own coin? No, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's going to be something that we're not thinking yet, right? That's going to be, uh, that's going to be the uh, change agent out of that. And, but I think that the, um, the industry as a whole, you look at companies like Stripe, right? You know, look at the innovation that they've brought to the market, um, you know, and then there's yeah, folks that have focused a bit more on the consumer side, right? So Stripe has focused more on the developer and the merchant side. And then you get folks like, you know, Affirm and Klarna and some others that have focused more on the customer side, right? The customer experience side um, and the flexibility of payments uh, and giving them more options outside of just using your, you know, your regular old uh, credit card or your local bank. And so I think FinTech is absolutely an area that will continue to garner interest and investment and growth. Um, I think logistics is another big area, right, that you mentioned right, as, we, as we speak about e-commerce and retail in particular, because I think um, it, it, my days at, uh, earlier when I was back at radio, one of the things that you know, we were trying to define for the industry, um, and I think we were still a little bit early for it, but it was uh, what we called a post-click commerce, right, post-order commerce how it's one thing to create a, a great compelling uh, e-commerce experience or digital, com digital commerce experience. Um, but the front end part of that, the ordering part of that, although critical and absolutely is a, is a game changer for you, right? It'll, it'll make or break your business in, in many cases. Um, it's still only part of the experience, right? And so once they press that order, uh, you know, the old way of thinking in e-commerce was, well, they'll, they'll get their order when they get it, right? Like, and we'll, we'll figure it out. But, you know, it was, it was all the attention, all the investment, all the innovation was really focused on that front end, right? The, how do we personalize the experience? How do we target the experience? How do we make it more compelling? How do we reduce the number of clicks to purchase? All of that, which is all very valuable things to do, right? And understand. Um, but when the order got placed, it was like, all right, just let the call center deal with them now, right? Um, and that, that was kind of like the old way of thinking, right? Uh, I, but I think what Amazon, a lot of cases, and they've done this with a number of things, but what Amazon did was when they started to, you know, when they really made like two-day shipping kind of the standard, right? Um, when even though it wasn't necessarily, uh, it wasn't always necessary <clears throat> for the customer, um, it started to create a new level of expectation, right? Um, well, let's say Amazon from a customer support perspective, at least in my experience, has a ways to go. Their sheer scale uh, on the logistics side and the ability to get product to the customer within a rapid period of time, uh, more times than not, um, was really a differentiator for them in that regard. And it was not something that individual retailers uh, or brands could compete with. And I think there was like this kind of culminating event where a number of years ago, you started to have folks, uh, uh, retailers and brands start to realize that the second part of their commerce experience, right? The delivery uh, to that customer was kind of broken. And in large part, that's the difference between having a happy customer or not. And also where you can eke out in the end, profitability, if you execute correctly, right? There is a, it is not, it's, a, it's in some cases, it's labor intense. I know there's a lot of automation coming into that space. And I think that's another big area that will continue to be investment, right? You see Shopify making investments there, Amazon making investment there. Um, so automation, when it comes to fulfillment and logistics, I think is a big area that will continue to garner interest uh, from, uh, from VCs and private equity. Um, but I think that 
that really is indicative of the fact that merchants and brands are starting to realize this is where we need to invest in. Now we've got this great site, but if we can't deliver now on the expectation the customer both believes in the experience we're presenting to them, as well as their experience with other brands a la Amazon, right? Um, it's going to be hard for us to keep that customer happy, right? And so I think being able to, again, go back, understand who your customer is, where they are, what, what items are of most uh, priority for them and interest to them, and then get it to them in a way that is going to meet those expectations. But again, still manage against your P&L, still manage against your profitability goals um, so that you have some type of, you know, uh, a uh, combination of kind of traditional warehouses and other forms of uh, uh, logistics or in the supply chain, even down to using old physical stores, retail stores, right? This is something we talked about 10, 12, 15 years ago, even, right? Like how do you use your stores more effectively uh, almost as fulfillment centers um, it, it, as one way. And so it's not as easy as it sounds. There's a lot of investment that has to happen there. And there's training and things that have to happen with the employees there that I think a lot of folks just took for granted in the early days. But if executed correctly, um, it can it can make or break both the customer experience and the profitability on on a uh, on an e-commerce business. So I think those areas, fintech and and logistics in particular, uh, are the areas that will continue to have um, a level of uh, focus and investment both from the merchants that need it, the brands that need it and from the VCs and such that, that want to uh, look for the next area in which they're gonna have return. Now it's not, it's gonna be fraught with error, right? Again, it's, there's, there's a lot of labor, there's a lot of costs, there's a lot of uh, uh, capital expenditure there. So um, it's not, there's not gonna be, it's not gonna be as, as big of a win rate, I think in, in many cases, but it is certainly gonna be an area that they will continue to invest in. Um, and then, Separate from that, I think, uh, you know, there, there will, uh, no doubt, there will be other, other areas of technology that comes up um, when it, uh, from, a, from a marketing perspective, from a personalization perspective. You can always make advancements and innovation there. I think we are coming up on a point where the market likely will go through some type of transformation, right? Like the, the Google, Facebook uh, uh, kind of duopoly at some point will change. Yep. Um, what will be the change agent for it? What will be the catalyst? Will it be governments coming in and breaking them up? I, I don't know about all that, but there will be something. There will be something that starts to create more opportunity for other companies. Um, and I think, uh, and, and that will, in, uh, as a result, create opportunities for vendors and startups and technology companies how to maximize those opportunities now, right? And how to diversify your, your engagement now, not just with Google and Facebook, but with these other channels and other opportunities. I think Miracle's one company of a startup that's done a really good job of like, how, to, how do you help companies think about marketplaces, right? Marketplaces, ironically, was kind of like one of the early examples of e-commerce. And then it kind of like drifted along as like a little bit of a stigma, right? It was kind of like, yeah. well, you know, that's not strategic, right? Um, but guess what? Marketplaces work if you if you if you set them up right. If you you know set yourself up to work with merchants, the the vendors, right, the correct way, uh, the suppliers, um, consumers, and and you know again I'll go back to Amazon. Amazon has proved this, right? If you have enough at scale and there's a trust level, and eBay, you know how long they've had a business around this, slightly different, right, consumer to consumer. But the concepts are there, right? Etsy's there. Walmart's been trying to penetrate this in a more successful way for a while. But marketplaces can work if you do it the right way, right? It's not, it's not field of dreams. It's not build it and they will come. But if you, if you think about it strategically and if you think about who the customers are that's gonna, that it's going to attract and how this can supplement or expand your, your ability, uh, your supply for that demand, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you do it the right way and you work with the right companies, then uh, that can be a big accelerant for the right business as well. It's not gonna be for everybody, but I think marketplaces, ironically, could be an area, uh, you know, around around the edges of it, could be a big area of, of investment in the future as well. I think dropship, yeah. omnichannel, all of those areas that are related to it. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I think whenever you talk about Amazon, I think the one metric which I really 
has always impressed me this whole order lead time. I think they have such a strong control on that metric and right to the supplier, the kind of relationship they have with the suppliers, the different merchants who sell over there, and the whole trust that they play with, with the consumers, it's just remarkable. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the kind of a reference point and the kind of benchmark they have set up for other players, it's very, very difficult for other people to achieve in this particular space. It is. And, it yeah. is. and especially, I think, when you are in this kind of a demand shock phase and, and, and it's, it's very important for the players to understand that kind of a demand volatility. And especially in this kind of a pandemic stage, they are still very well versed. They have still shown a lot of resilience. And it seems like they have gone through these phases multiple times. I remember uh, uh, when I was at GSA Commerce, uh, somewhere around the global financial crisis era, around 2007, 2008, uh, I ordered uh, the Kindle, the, the Kindle when they launched in the market. I still remember that instance that when the Kindle was delivered at the office, right after that, within 45 minutes, I received a very personalized email from Amazon. Just talk, imagine, uh, we're talking about 13 years ago. And uh, the, the email said, hey, Sushant, uh, we love, uh, we hope you love your Kindle. And you know, I know it's very fragile and uh, seems like you forgot to order a nice leather cover for that. Would you like uh, to place an order for a nice leather cover to protect that delicate piece of beast that you're holding in your hand so that your book reading experience can be better? And I would think, wow, that's so timely because that was exactly the kind of experience I had because when I opened the box and that Kindle was in my hand, well, I thought, oh my God, it's so fragile. I might break it so easily. And it's so perfect timing. And within 45 minutes, I place an order. And yeah. I think, oh my God, they, how they get that experience, how they, how they know what the human psychic is. And that's remarkable. Yeah, they, they invested, you know, there's a lot of folks that obviously, you know, Amazon is kind of the, uh, the evil empire for a lot of folks in the industry, right? But um, the reality is, and, and there's a lot of truth to that, to, to some degree as well, if you, you know, you read plenty of stories of, of, uh, of how they... <clears throat> how they basically farm new new products and opportunities out of their marketplace, right? And they end up being a, a competitor to them. And back at uh, <clears throat> my eBay Inc. days, right? That was part of the vision. John Donahill was was very clear in that. And it's unfortunate it, it didn't, we didn't have enough time, I think, to play that out. Who knows whether or not we ever would have executed it in a way that was that was meaningful enough. But there was a vision there that I think other folks had as well. But you know, how to really create opportunity for merchants and brands that want the benefit of scale, want the benefit of marketplace and one-to-many um, as an alternative to Amazon in a way and with a company that doesn't also compete with you, <laughs> right? And I think that Amazon, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword for sure, right? And you got to know what you're doing when you get into it. I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's massively... Uh, 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 it's a massive opportunity for, for many, many businesses. And um, it's not something they should shy away from, but it's not something they should walk in blind to either, right? You just have to understand there is a disintermediation, there is an opportunity for piracy, um, and, uh, and, and there's all kinds of horror stories of, uh, you know, short-term gain and long-term pain type of stuff if, when you start having any kind of like real success on Amazon. Um, but they knock them, complain about them, whatever you want. The reality is they have been investing in their dominance for decades now, right? They saw where the puck was going. Uh, they, they knew that their ability, I mean, I'm, whatever it was, maybe 10 years ago or something, uh, you know, there were a lot of folks that kept saying, why are they building so many fulfillment centers? Why are they building so many warehouses all over the place? Right. Like this just seems, you know, crazy that why aren't they taking more profit? Why do they keep pumping money back into the business? And why do they keep expanding? When are they ever going to become profitable? And so the fact that they were building out that that warehouse business, the logistics business that ultimately is, is one of the key differentiators for them now at scale. Um, but I think in fairness, we do have to acknowledge they are they've gotten so far beyond a traditional retailer that 
it also is an, it's an unfair comparison now for retailers. They're, they are not a model that I, I think realistically almost any other, re maybe Walmart, um, but realistically there's nobody else that's going to follow what exactly the path that they took, right? So not only did they take, they had the benefit of being this, you know, this early internet company, right? This dot-com company that got through the bust, right? And was sticking around and people felt like, wow, this is, this is really something, right? E-commerce has really become a thing. We're going to invest in this company, right? And they kept taking that money and they reinvested. So one part of it was the logistics side, their technology side, their personalization side on their website and the data, the harvesting that they did. But the other part was creating a, a hook with their customers that right now would be hard to see anybody else to replicate, right? So, you know, they, they created Prime. Okay, all right, so you got this two-day shipping program. All right, that's great. But guess what? It's not just about two-day shipping, right? So now you've got, look at all the different things, right? So Amazon got, I remember Amazon getting into making movies and the hell's Amazon getting into movies and music? Guess what? Because all that turns into value proposition now. It's an investment in keeping the customer, right? And so you've got video, you've got music, you got all these things that they can throw at these, comp these customers, right, at scale that just creates more value that when you get that used to be 70 bucks, now it's 100 bucks, whatever it is a year, right, to stay with Prime, there's so many more reasons to say, yeah, all right. Uh, you know, now some people that hundred dollars a year or 150 bucks a year, whatever it ends up being is easy, right? Cause they, they shop so much from them. It's a, it's an easy investment. Others, maybe they're on the cusp of like, man, it's starting to feel expensive, but guess what? Like one or two nights a week, I'm hitting that Amazon prime app on my TV and I'm watching X, Y, Z, you know, uh, show or movie. Right. So there's all these things that start to play into it that they've gone beyond what traditional retailers uh, have, you know, are, are in position to compete, compete against. Um, and then, and then that's not to mention the whole AWS business, right? So the AWS business in and of itself, and I've, I've kind of mentioned this before, I'm not, I'm not really a big breakup, uh, advocate. Uh, I, I think, you know, in many cases, let, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a free market person, let the market kind of dictate where things go, but there always is, you know, there's certain times in history where you have to, you have to, you know, squeeze a little bit to make sure folks don't take advantage of their position. Um, the one area I do question, which I think would be an easy place uh, for Amazon to concede um, now that they've gotten to the scale, uh, not that they'd want to do it, but if they ever had the hooks pushed to them, right, to say, you know, we, we need, we really need to break up Amazon. They're too big. They're too powerful. They're, they're so far beyond what any of their traditional retail competitors could, could compete against. Um, what's an area that we could, you know, kind of chop them at the knees, so to speak. AWS is the one area I'd say, because you could decouple AWS from the rest of the business and it's a very different business, right? Now, what hurts it is that it's a cash cow that helps them reinvest in everything else on the other side, right? Um, but they've gotten to the point where they've built that up so much that uh, I'm not sure at this point, it's, uh, it's almost like, you know, at some point PayPal had to be separated from eBay, right? Like at yep. some point I kind of, I, I kind of think whether it's going to come from the private side, right? You know, there's a, you know, um, uh, activist investors, whatever the case may be, I could see it AWS at some point breaking off. And then maybe there's a little bit more of a direct comparison of what Amazon is at that point versus, uh, you know, retailers but they will have still of amassed such a position and such scale and such information now that kind of self funds itself um, that it, it, they'll still be, they'll still be a really hard competitor to ever really beat. Uh, but it all, and this is a long winded way of saying the experience you had 12 years ago, right? Was the very early days of them where they were making those investments and understanding their customers and understanding their merchandise. Um, that methodology of, under, of trying to just understand every piece of the, the, the customer journey, every piece of the transaction, every piece of information that's flowing through them, um, whether it be through their marketplace of sellers or them directly, 
that's why they made you know all that information just like they said hey why don't you buy this leather case they said to themselves let's invest in logistics let's yep. invest in video let's invest in music let's hey you know this aws thing this this uh this server thing that we've built out here that has given us scale that could be a business right yep. let's let's kick that out and start selling it to others so it's amazing really i mean they're you know i know they're they're an easy punching bag for folks but when you think about it, it's, it's amazing what they've been able to accomplish. And they're at a point now where it's really hard. It's easy to do. It's easy to keep say like, Hey, look at Amazon. And but it's really hard and unfair in a lot of cases to say what they do is what other people should do now because they're just at such a different level. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So, so my, my team, my last question for today is uh, what are your two big bets for the coming financial year? Where do you think the industry is heading to and where would you invest? Uh, well, so interesting. So I think that, um, my, I'll modify the question or my answer to the question a little bit in, in a sense that I, I'll, I'll look beyond just the balance of this year. Cause I think there's still a lot of uncertainty in the next call it six or seven months. Right. I think that, um, anyone saying they know for sure what's going to happen, uh, with any degree of certainty is, is, uh, is, is they're, they're at least a lot smarter than me or they're being disingenuous. Um, and I think that, but for me, I think there are, it's about where does the land, how does the landscape look 12 months from now, 18 months from now, whatever the case may be, whenever this kind of new normal sets in, what changes that happen as a result of, or during this time become the standard, right? Um, or change the way the mix of business is in, uh, in 12 or 18 months. And so um, I think that, you know, we've talked about a few examples of things that, you know, things that will change over time. I think there were certainly going to be companies that were on a path of chapter 11 or failure that that will continue. Right. Um, and, and COVID is, uh, is, is uh, in a lot of cases, just the push that, that uh, not that they needed, right. It's unfortunate. Yeah. It's unfortunate for the people that they, that work for them. It's unfortunate for the people that do uh, buy from them. But you know there are companies like the J.C. Penneys, et cetera, that were they were on that path already. Uh, calling them a victim of COVID-19 is, is, in my opinion, disingenuous as well. So I think there is going to be a different landscape 12 or 18 months from now. There are going to be companies that fail that more times than not were or more times than not were probably already on that path, and this just kind of pushed it over the edge. Um, it wasn't the cause. Uh, and I'm not talking about just as a disclaimer, obviously the, you know, the local towns, the small businesses, which I think is, is, you know, unfortunately a big victim in this, right? So I think that there are local restaurants, local bars, local hair salons, uh, you name it. A lot of them unfortunately won't open again. Um, hopefully new ones do right when all this is said and done. Uh, but uh, I think they're, you know, that I'll put that to the side. I, I don't want to claim to be an expert in that area, but just an acknowledgement of there, there is, uh, unfortunately, there's some carnage on that, on that end of the economy. Um, but when I look at the, the larger side of kind of the e-business, e-commerce, um, I think e-learning is an area that is going to continue to uh, uh, accelerate, right? I think COVID in a lot of cases may be an accelerant to that what these, mm -hmm. you know, what high schools and universities and things of that nature, how do they have to think about um, diversifying and creating more opportunity and options for them to service their end user, right? The students, yep. right? Uh, in particular, private schools and universities, right? Where there's, there's kind of, you know, there's a revenue element to this. Um, so e-learning, I think in, in many, in, in large cases is going to be uh, a benefactor um, of, uh, of this unfortunate pandemic. Um, and then I think, um, grocery is another example, right? And I'm sure there's a, a larger list, but grocery for me, I could say just personally, I know that, you know, we were, we were a family that never used, never used. And I'm, e you know, e-commerce guy for 20 years, right? <laughs> never used e-commerce for grocery, yeah. never ordered anything online, right? We always just went to the store. We picked our own stuff and, over the last two months, I think I've been to the store three times, three or four times, right? I can count on one hand how many times I've been physically to a store. The rest of that has been uh, online ordering, right? And I think that while 
it's not going to completely shift to online ordering, right? There are people that are busting out of the seams to get out of their house, go to stores and shop and again, be social, um, especially certain things, right? There are things like produce and meats and things like that. People like to pick their own stuff. Uh, but I do think by and large, this will accelerate the percentage of uh, online ordering, whether they go there to pick it up or they have it delivered. Online ordering for grocery, um, I would expect, um, and we'll see if this plays out, but I would expect the percentage of that in terms of overall order volume uh, to notably go up. Again, I don't think it'll, it certainly won't stay at the percentage that it's at now, right? Mm -hmm. That's artificial. Um, like we talked about earlier with essentials. Um, but I do think that whatever its new baseline will be is going to be higher than what the, the previous peak was. Um, and so I think that uh, that will absolutely be an area that, and I think the, you know, those stores, they'll be making investments in that, right? They will continue to make investments because they know they don't want to be caught with this the next time around, right? And that's another case of, unfortunately, the bigger getting big, right? So, you know, Walmart's done really well there, right? Target's invested in grocery. And then, of course, you got the big old bad Amazon, right, through their uh, yep. Whole Foods uh, acquisition. Um, and so, you know, local groceries or other grocery companies that are still big, but they don't play in any other spaces, right? Like Walmart does, like Target does, like Amazon. If they are very distinctly um, grocery, they will be making investments because they have to, right, as a, as a strategic imperative for them uh, to compete. Uh, because I think this introduced the same kind of convenience that consumers have come accustomed to uh, in other walks of life, right? right? Whether it's automate home automation or on-demand video viewing or, you know, streaming uh, video or music, um, you know, having click of a button, have my, uh, have my milk, have my cereal, have my, you know, my, uh, my flour, my sugar, everything kind of delivered to my doorstep. Um, there are some folks that, it might be hard to, to, to go back to <laughs> go back to the old world. Right. Um, and so uh, I think that that's going to be, that's certainly uh, going to be an area of, of change and growth. Uh, so e-learning and grocery, I think are the two obvious examples to me that I think will be kind of a, a new normal in the future. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so with this, my, uh, Marty, we are concluding our today's episode today. And thank you so much for taking our time. I know it's a weekend and sharing with us your words of wisdom. And to all our listeners, uh, if you have any questions, any comments, please post it below this video. If you have any suggestions for the new topic, please also mention that. And until then, stay safe, stay connected and keep flourishing. Thank you. Thank you, Sam.